I'm Jessica Rathke, and uh, I am a, a sales consultant for translation companies such as yourselves. I have about 21 years of experience, and all of my experience is essentially in sales and sales management and marketing in the industry. I've pretty much only ever worked in translation and localization. So hopefully I can share with you some things today um, based on my experience because for the most part, I have only ever worked remotely. I've worked in uh, a headquarters setting twice in my career, so about five years total, and the rest of uh, those 16 years was, was remote. So what I'd like to share is how managing salespeople who are remote, uh, how that can be a competitive advantage for you if they're managed correctly. And we'll focus on some things, what I would call alignment between a sales candidate and the company. So making sure that their, the salesperson's goals are in line with your corporate goals. And then just a few tips on managing people for success because it is a little bit different managing people who um, you don't have immediate access to. You can't just walk down the hallway and have a conversation with them. Um, it's, it requires either a telephone conversation or in our industry, email. We tend to live and die by email. So I'll step you through um, a few ideas about how to evaluate sales candidates, especially from a remote sort of perspective. In terms of key attributes for a salesperson, I mean, these would be pretty much the same for anybody, whether they're remote or not. But it's good to start from this, this perspective. So these would be kind of my, I think this is 12 rather than my top 10. Um, I would say, you know, some of the ones that are really important to me would be the top one, which is competitive. Salespeople are by nature, we need to be a bit competitive because we're out there trying to win business against competitors. So I think that's very important. A second attribute would be a self-starter, especially in a remote environment. Um, you have to be pretty confident that the person is going to get up every day, make it to their desk and make, make those phone calls. And I found it initially quite, quite difficult because I was working at home in one of my extra bedrooms. and. I don't know, it just felt like there were always things to do. The neighbor kids would come over and want to show me their new bike and all these disruptions that really wouldn't happen in an office setting. So that would be a key one. And I think being uh, a problem solver and being able to communicate very well um, the needs that you have a, a salesperson to management because you are remote. Um, and, and I found it very difficult sometimes to get the information I needed and part of that was my problem because I expected it to be given to me and I really had to learn how to ask for it. Now, there are a lot of questions in terms of interviewing a sales candidate to kind of find out this information. So this would be my top list of questions and some of these are not very easy questions for a salesperson to answer and that's, that's the whole idea is to make it difficult and get them talking so that you can identify the qualities that they have. So it's actually this process will help you identify those qualities that we're looking for in a salesperson. Um, I, one of my favorites is the bottom one, which is how do you think you can add value to your com our company and how would you sell our services? That's a really difficult interview question and it will identify a couple of things. One is it's going to identify whether the person's even taken the time to learn about your company. So have they been on your website? Have they read information about you? And then more importantly, if they can even articulate um, an understanding of that company in sort of a sales setting. So in some ways, I like to think of uh, an interview of a salesperson as a sales call. So that salesperson really should be treating it as a sales call and they should be selling themselves to you uh, as managers. And if you're a salesperson, I mean, I think this is what you should be doing. Um, because that will tell you what kind of sales skills they have. If they can articulate their value to you, um, I think that's a good indicator of how they will articulate um, your value to potential customers out in the marketplace. Now, one of the things that I found really interesting in thinking about this, when I put this presentation together, I had never really ever once been asked a single question about how I function in a remote environment. Not one of my employers ever asked me these questions. And I think it's so important because a lot of people think they might want to work in a remote environment, but find they aren't really cut out to do it. I think it is, again, very difficult because you don't have that immediate feedback. You can't just walk down the, the hallway to speak to your manager. 
And so getting an idea of whether they have experience working remotely or how they feel about working remotely, um, how they feel they're going to build relationships with coworkers. And for those of you who um, were in Bob Donaldson and my presentation earlier uh, about the relationship between sales and production, I mean, this is compounded um, by working remotely because it's very difficult to build a rapport with your coworkers if you're a couple hundred or thousands of kilometers away. And so, you know, asking this, this sort of question of a salesperson in terms of what would they do to build a rapport with, with their coworkers is a very important one because they have to have a relationship with production people. They'll be sending files off for analysis. They'll have to write a proposal or at least prepare a quote. And they'll have to be able to talk very well with production people on those topics. And then in terms of, I don't know how many of you will have time zone issues, but I've certainly had serious time zone issues. So, you know, does the person mind being at, up at four o'clock in the morning to have a conversation with their coworkers um, or working at 1130 at night, uh, which I've done quite a lot of. And, you know, sometimes it was quite disruptive and we used to have a lottery at, at a couple of my uh, employers where we had global people. And so one of us would be very inconvenienced once every couple of months. Um, so we took turns in being up in the middle of the night. But it's an important thing to think about, and it's really critical, I think, to ask these questions of somebody who's going to work remotely. Again, it's a trust issue. You, you can't see what these people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, nor uh, the salesperson themselves are, are going to be able to um, demonstrate what they're doing on a daily basis. And we'll talk about some ways to, to get around that, that problem. But before we get there, we need to really decide if the candidate is a good fit. And um, when we're out in the marketplace evaluating sale, potential salespeople for a job, uh, there are three main areas I'll cover today, although there are more. And, and those three would be, do you, do you hire someone who has experience or someone who's new to the industry? And there are pros and cons to each side of that. Are you a startup or are you an established company? And, by that, I mean, you know, do you have, is it a bit chaotic if you're a startup or are you an established company with lots of processes and procedures and how does that candidate fit in that? And then hiring locally or do you transfer someone to the market? And there, there are good arguments on both sides of that. So let's take a look um, at, at this alignment issue. Again, when I've worked in a remote environment, people, the, my management more or less assumed that I didn't have career ambitions, that, that I just wanted to be a sales rep forever. And that was really not the case. But I, as a salesperson, and the company never asked those questions. So I found myself in some companies being quite frustrated because I suddenly realized there was no career path for me. So it's really important to find out what, what career ambitions the salesperson has. Um, in a remote environment, there, there are sometimes administrative tasks that a salesperson may have to do, financial responsibilities, maybe they have to pay bills, maybe they have, you know, different uh, things, you know, just even ordering supplies that would just happen if they were in, a, in an office environment. And does the compensation reflect these extra tasks? Because a salesperson wants to focus on selling, they don't want to do administrative things, so there has to be a reason, there has to be some sort of incentive for them to do it. Um, compensation schemes, I mean, that's a whole, that could be a whole different presentation, but thinking about does the compensation scheme fit the market? And if it's out of sync with the market, the person is unlikely to stay if they're underpaid. If they're overpaid, you just may not get the productivity out of them. So again, doing some research and finding out what the standards are in terms of compensation is very important. Uh, is the compens does the compensation reflect what the person is doing? So are, are they strictly new business development? And if so, is it, is it common in the, in the target country or target market for it to be maybe more heavily commission-based based compensation? So for example, in the United States, you would definitely want to have a very good commission structure. Um, in Europe, maybe not, you know, commission may not be such a, a big item, but certainly in the U.S. it would be uh, financial incentives are a big thing, um, and they would absolutely need to happen. Um, in terms of, you know, so if it's new business development, thinking about that, if the person is a farmer or somebody who's more account manager, 
then the compensation might be a little bit different. And do you incentivize them to grow accounts? And what does that look like? And making sure that their expectations and your expectations are in, uh, synchronized or in alignment. And then I've already mentioned the long-term career objectives. Um, you know, does the person expect a career path? And in my case, I did, and I, I did become quite frustrated. And, and in that case, nobody was happy. My employer wasn't happy because I kept asking for a promotion and I kept not getting one. So, you know, it was, it, you know, I ended up moving on and that was bad for everybody. So let's take a look at the, the three main areas that I mentioned before. So whether we hire a seasoned salesperson or whether we hire uh, a, someone without experience. And I think there, there are pluses and minuses to both sides of this. So an, a person with existing experience or industry experience is likely to have existing contacts. They may be able to bring business to your company much more quickly because they have those contacts. They have an understanding of the industry, so you don't really have as much training to do. And um, you know, they may or may not have uh, remote sales experience. So looking at the plus side, that's a good thing. But on the bad side, they may have, uh, particularly in uh, English-speaking countries and some Western European countries, will have contractual obligations in terms of not non-compete. So, for example, every time I've changed jobs, I was not allowed to contact existing customers from my former employer. And I wasn't allowed to do that for a minimum of six months. Um, in some places, it's a year. So. The idea, sometimes I think companies really want to hire people with experience because they think they can bring their customer base with them and that isn't always the case. Um, and that can be a really, you know, a, a false perception because it's very difficult to do. And, you know, some, some people I've known in the industry have um, sort of ignored those rules and they've actually been sued um, and have had to pay financial compensation. So it's not really a good idea to do. And, Really and truly, I wouldn't expect a salesperson to bring people with them um, because if they leave you, are they going to steal your clients away as well? So that's a good thing to think about. I think hiring from outside the industry might be a good thing. You can train them exactly the way you want them to be trained. They'll know your processes. They'll know your value add. They'll understand everything about you. There won't be this unlearning that has to happen. And I must say, I've had to unlearn a lot um, because I've changed jobs a lot. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I, I'd be in a sales call and I'm thinking, well, I'm selling my former employer, not my current one. So that's a, a slippery slope that, that we can get into. But on the downside, hiring somebody without um, industry experience, it's going to take them a while to understand what they're selling. And so expecting revenue very quickly is probably unrealistic. So. Those are some things to think about in terms of seasoned and new uh, employees. Startups versus highly established. Um, I've worked in both, and I must say, I prefer working in the, the highly structured environment. I like to know what the rules are, and I like to, um, to sort of follow them. I didn't function as well in a startup environment where things were very chaotic. I had to make up things as I went along. Um, I had to do a little bit of everything. So I did production work and sales work and customer service work and lots of things. You know, thinking about that when you're talking to a potential sales person for your company is important to think about because not everybody functions well in a very chaotic environment. Um, other people like me, I like the stability, I like the structure, I like to know what's happening. I like that sense of security that it provides me for whatever reason, it's just the way I am. Um, and again, I made a mistake by going to a startup and it, I found it slightly difficult to adjust. And uh, so again, it's something really good to think about when you're hiring somebody. And maybe tailoring some questions around, around these issues to, to find out um, whether they're comfortable or not. Now, hiring locally versus transfer, I'm, I'm of two minds on this. I'm, I'm proof positive that someone can move from uh, one country to another and sell and be successful. 
Admittedly, I didn't have language issues to deal with. I moved from the US to the UK, and it's worked out very well. At the same time, I thought my market knowledge was a bit better than it was, so my ramp up time was a little bit longer than I anticipated and my employer. So thinking about those things, I, I knew the company well because I had happened to have worked there before, so that was a real advantage, but I didn't know the market. I way underestimated, uh, because I was home-based, it took a month for me to get broadband, and I didn't realize that difference between the US and the UK, and so I ended up working from Starbucks, I think, for the first two weeks. And um, I, I knew Starbucks so well, I asked them to change their CD because I heard it all day long listening to the same music. So that was not very good. It wasn't the most productive place for me to work from, so I underestimated that. But in the long run, it really did, it worked quite well. But I've seen other circumstances where people have transferred from one country to another and it has been very difficult. You know, they understand your company, but they may not understand the, the market as well. And so it's a trade-off in terms of what you're comfortable with and what they're comfortable with and deciding that. Hiring somebody local is really effective because they will understand the target market, they'll understand business practices, they'll understand most everything. If you need somebody to set up an office, they'll know what to do and how to do it. If there are any legal issues or what have you, they'll have some, some idea. So that can be a real positive in, in that respect. I think also hiring locally, it does take time for the person to understand who you are as a company. I think the trust issue is a really huge one um, because you're hiring on a leap of faith and hoping the person is going to deliver sales to you. And they're being hired on a leap of faith, hoping that you can do the work that they're planning to sell. And that trust takes a long time to develop. And I strongly recommend if you hire someone in you know, the target market, that you bring them to your, your headquarters for at least a, a week or two, just so that they can get to know everybody in the company, build those relationships. Because when you're hundreds or thousands of kilometers away, um, it becomes much more difficult. And so even if you've just shaken hands and seen a face and, and can put the name with the, the person, and it also gives them an opportunity to really learn and, and gain the knowledge so that they're very knowledgeable in the marketplace. So again, there, there, there are pluses and minuses to every side of this story, and it really, again, comes down to what your, is it a match with, is the person a match with your business objectives? Are they a match with your company culture? Are they a match with, with how quickly you want them to ramp up? Are they a match with, with the kind of business you're selling? And you know, do they have the flexibility to work in a remote environment? So let's just take the leap that you've hired somebody and you have them in, in, in that market. So before you, you really turn them loose into the marketplace and before they begin selling, uh, it's really helpful to provide the salesperson with the tools so that they can be effective. So I've alluded to that already and certainly try to integrate the person into the company. I can say from personal experience, it feels, it's hard to feel a part of a company when you're thousands of, well for me, thousands of miles away. And uh, I think it's up to both parties to make sure that that relationship works and the information is constantly being communicated back and forth. So training, I've mentioned. So what's, what is it about your company that's great? What is unique about it? What's the history about it? What are your goals? It's very important for this person to understand what your business goals are because they're communicating it to your customers. Um, and it comes across the, the amount of knowledge and trust and relationship between them and, and headquarters. Making sure that, that the salesperson understands what tools and technology um, you use. I've, I've taken jobs, I, in fact I took a job when I went to McElroy Translation, for those of you who were here earlier, um, I didn't know that localization could be into English as well. It never occurred to me and I never asked the question. It was really quite bizarre. Um, I had always thought of English into many and suddenly, you know, and the tools that we had in place at the company were very much geared from many into one rather than one into many. And, oh, we went round and round and round. It was really um, interesting. Uh, and we ended up having to do you know, serious workarounds. But that, that's just a, a minor example of something that my expectations were completely shattered in a way because what I was supposed to sell didn't fit into our production process. So that scared me a little. Um, it's really helpful for a salesperson to meet key personnel. So who is the CEO? Who is the 
production manager, who's the operations manager, who make, who's the finance person, who's paying my salary so I know it's going to make it into the bank um, once a month. Who are these people? And, and meeting project managers as well and being able to develop a rapport with project managers because sales and project management people work together a lot. What are the marketing initiatives? Do you, you know, do you have a website? Do you have a blog? Do you do Twitter? Do you have brochures? Are they translated? All these things um, are very helpful if they're in place before the salesperson comes on board or at least put in place once they're on board. And they're just silly things like a, a administrative things. Um, how do I file an expense report if I'm traveling? Where, where do I find the form to fill out? And again, some of this information was incredibly difficult to, to get out of some of my, uh, my former employers. Just simple things, but if those are thought about and in place, it just makes things work a bit more nicely and we can focus on actually doing business rather than messing around with issues like administrative things. So from taking that to sales management, when the person comes on board, when the new salesperson is finally on board and ready to go out and sell, of course, business owners want them to be highly productive and they want to see lots of phone calls and lots of quotes and lots of things happening. And that comes down to helping to motivate the person as well, which is also difficult to do from hundreds or thousands of miles away. And then I'll talk about knowing some of the people in the audience today. I'll, make a, I'll do a bit of an overview on some cultural issues. Um, it's based on my experience. I can't really speak for um, how um, Eastern European or Russian culture will fit into other markets, but uh, this might give some ideas in terms of thinking about um, what to consider. Motivation is, is key, and figuring out what makes your salesperson kind of tick and what, what will help them want to be productive on your behalf. So I, I find it really nice to be recognized for more than just my revenue contribution. I mean, salespeople, it's revenue, revenue, bring in the revenue. Um, but there are other things that motivate salespeople besides bringing in revenue. And I really like to be recognized for some of the contributions I've made. Two examples, one of the companies I worked for had extreme dysfunction between the sales team and the production team. And I took the initiative to, to sort of build a bridge between the two organizations. And I was formally recognized for that, and I was given theater tickets for it. You know, because we, we ended up writing processes for how sales and production could work together. And it was something so simple, but theater tickets means a lot to me. And I got to go to theater twice in London for that. And it was just, it was just really nice. And it really made me motivated and want to do even more for the company. Something, I mean, more so than even a commission, really. It, it meant a lot because it was personal. It meant something to me. And it told me that my boss actually understood who I was. <laughs> so I think that's important. And another thing I think that sometimes gets overlooked in sales is salespeople want to learn. Salespeople want to improve their skills. They want to do a better job. They want to hone those skills, and some kind of sales training is, is very helpful. I mean, the market is shifting out there, and things are moving much more quickly, and salespeople need to acquire new skills because the market is changing. Um, and also, I think production people tend to get lots of training on tools and technology, but salespeople need to understand these things too. We have to articulate this to our customers, and while we may not need the in-depth training, that a production person might need, it, it is very helpful for me to be able to, I don't know, wh whatever tool we're using internally, if I can explain that to a customer, it's really, really helpful. Um, and this is a great way to build the bridge between sales and production. Have a production person give training to sales on a tool or on a process, and, and suddenly you're getting that communication between the two. Um, keeping salespeople remote people in particular informed of company developments and I'll just tell you a very quick story and I won't need to explain any further. I got a call from a customer one time who uh, said, oh, I just, I just read your press release that you're acquiring another company and I had no idea what the person was talking about. So my customer knew about an acquisition that our company was making that my management didn't tell me and I felt very stupid. <laughs> So again, it's really helpful for sales you know, remote people of any kind to, to understand what's happening in the company. And I think sometimes, you know, because we're remote, people forget 
that were there, and uh, that can be <coughs> detrimental. I certainly look, didn't look very smart in front of that customer. Communicate often and be available. Uh, I'll, I'll, I tend to talk in stories, so I'll tell a story about this. I, I, I've had, I had one manager who was absolutely amazing, and he, he was one of the busiest people I, I knew. He managed a team of about 600 people, plus a sales team, and so he, he, he was more of an operations person, but involved in sales. And there were times when I absolutely had to discuss I don't know, it might be a pricing issue or a production issue, or could we be flexible here, particularly when I was negotiating with a customer. And um, we had a code system that was so simple, but he never answered his phone ever. I don't think he ever picked up his telephone, but he checked his messages about every 15 minutes. And I would leave a message, the first words out of my mouth were urgent, call me. And I think one time it took him 20 minutes to call me, most of the time it took him 10. And what that did is it ended up making me look very smart in the customer because the customer didn't know I had called my manager. But I could call her back in five minutes and say, oh, yeah, we can do that, or I can change the price here, or we can adjust this there. I couldn't have made that, I wasn't authorized to make that decision myself, but by having a manager who was very responsive to that, I was able to uh, come back to the customer and win the business. Um, and everything moves so quickly today, responsiveness means everything. So that's, that's a great story, and I, he's probably my favorite manager ever because of that. And then being aware of cultural differences and managing remote sales staff, I, I find it odd that I have to mention this amongst in the localization business, but it really is true because we tend to manage to our own cultures. It's, it's, it, it's our nature, it's, and especially in headquarters, it's... Um, when I've worked for a British company, for example, headquarters was in Britain and I was in the US, but they managed me in a very British way. And as an American, I really hated it. Um, and sometimes there just wasn't the sensitivity to how I did things. And so there was a little bit of tension there. And um, even, even in an English speaking world, the, the cultural differences are very much there. And so it did cause some problems and we used to have to have some you know, I would have to raise some issues. Good to be aware of. Um, how am I doing on time anyway? I don't know since I started late. Uh, I'll keep going and if you want to leave, leave. The way around, a lot of motivation just has, has a lot to do with how clear we make the objectives for our salespeople. So establishing very specific, measurable objectives for salespeople, remote ones in particular, is very important because it gives managers a way to manage without being intrusive. Um, there are lots of tools in the marketplace that facilitate this, like Salesforce.com or Zoho or you know some of the online um, CRM systems. Establishing a formal communication plan. So, do you speak to your salesperson once a week, once every two weeks? If you have more than one salesperson remotely, or you have salespeople in your home office and maybe one remote person, have a group call. Group calls are fantastic for sharing knowledge, for sharing understanding, talking about problems, talking about how that somebody won a client so that everybody can learn from one another. And I found those kinds of conversations, again, for me personally, it was very motivating uh, as a salesperson to learn from other people because, again, I can't walk down the hall and call just have a conversation or a water cooler chat with, with my coworkers. It, it, it had to be a much more formal sort of arrangement. Um, and then looking and monitoring goals. So what are the goals? Is the person achieving them? But not waiting until you found that revenue isn't happening. That's why m establishing specific goals, like how many calls are they making? How many quotes are they doing? How many meetings are they having? How many C-level meetings are they having? Um, those are great things uh, to manage rather than just revenue because revenue we get surprised at the end oh gosh we haven't made our numbers oh dear what do we do so revenue is kind of a lagging indicator and I, I like to think of managing towards the future managing things that cause revenue to happen and that's much more vo motivating than at the end of the year or the end of the quarter beating your salesperson up because they haven't made their numbers it's both people's fault then um, 
So carrying on. So cultural differences, I have to say this is because I can't make assumptions. It, this is between the US and, and Europe as I know it, so mainly Western European bias. So some of this may not apply to you, but I think some of it probably does. And for me, when I worked for European companies in the US, one of the things I found very frustrating is um, there's an American tendency to want to do things yourself. So you get general guidance and then let them loose and, and make their own decisions. And I found, I felt very micromanaged because I had to do things in a specific way at a specific time in a, with a specific format and it just drove me bonkers. So I'll talk about American managers managing Europeans. So there, there is this predisposition of American managers to do things that drive Europeans nuts, at least as far as I understand it. There's a tendency for American managers to praise people all the time for doing their job, which I know drives, I, I think Germany in particular, I've had Germans tell me that that just drives them crazy. Why am I being complimented for doing my job? I'm doing my job. Um, but for, as, as for me as an American, I like to, American people like to receive that. We like to get the pat on the back and we like to hear you doing a great job. And they're, they're very distinct differences, but I, on the other side, when I wasn't getting that praise from my European management, I thought I was doing a bad job. And so I was constantly asking, you know, am I doing okay? And I was driving my management nuts because I kept asking them if I was doing okay. And they're like, well, you'll know when you're doing a bad job. Okay. <laughs> but it is, so, you know, very, very subtle things can really trip you up. And they just, they, they thought I was out of my mind. But in any case, it did, it did cause me to really wonder, am I, am I doing okay? Um, there are some things in Europe as well. A European or an American manager will probably bother Europeans a bit because American managers tend to be good at management, management but not necessarily at the task. So, um, you know, they don't necessarily come up through the ranks. They might be hired from outside from a completely different industry, but they're hired because of their management expertise, not their expertise in operations or production or whatever, whoever they're managing. Uh, Americans tend to wear their authority lightly, so they just let you get on, uh, get on with it, but don't think the authority isn't there because if you trip up, you'll find out that it's definitely there. Um, but I think Europeans tend to uh, expect a more authoritative approach than, than Americans actually give. And I think one of the biggest is um, Americans live to work, Europeans work to live. And I know m a lot of my European friends don't like working for American companies because there is this expectation that you're just going to work all the time. And, you know, you, what, you're going on holiday again? Yes, it's mandated by law. I can go on holiday. What? Um, and I think Americans have this tendency to uh, underestimate the complexity of the European market. We're just, we, we look for the commonalities in everybody and that just isn't always the case. Now taking it the other way around, which is probably more applicable to this, this room, from my perspective as an American salesperson, I found that European managers didn't delegate very much, um, much more wanting to hold control. The lack of frequent praise, as I already mentioned. I expect my manager to be a good manager, as I've said, rather than being expert in, what they, in, in, in the task, necessarily. I think sometimes Europeans can underestimate differences in the American market, or even Britain. There's a big difference. There's a north-south divide in both countries. And in the north, people tend to be a bit, well, in the UK, they tend to be a bit friendlier, and in the south, they tend to be not, not as friendly. Um, and how you do business is very different in the two areas. And in the US, there's sort of north, south, east, west, where north tends to be more formal, east definitely even more formal than that, south pretty relaxed, west coast surfers. So. They, there is a, a fair difference in, in the way um, people behave in business. So West Coast, you would take a much more relaxed approach. On the East Coast, I recommend that you speak quickly and fast and get to the point very fast because they won't take time to listen. And the other thing I think that drives Americans a bit <sighs> is the European tendency to be more cautious in making decisions. And um, we kind of view that as weakness and indecisiveness rather than cautious, and um, it, it kind of brings out a bad American trait, which it can be summed up in ready, fire, aim. So we just go out and do it, and if it doesn't work, we just do it differently, and if that doesn't work, we do it differently again. And so it's, 
those kinds of things can raise some tensions. And um, I, I know from some of my coworkers in the U.S., we used to grouse about our management all the time. Oh, they just won't. I don't know. We just moaned and complained quite a bit. So I hope this gives you an overview. Um, I would take this with a grain of salt. It's, I, I know there are overgeneralizations, but there are always truth to some, some kinds of stereotypes. Maybe there are some suggestions in there that you can kind of take for yourselves and use. But I'll leave it at that. I'm finished with my presentation. If you have questions, my Russian is so limited to about five words, <laughs> but maybe we can have someone help out. So, okay. Uh, we need a microphone. Is this one? Yeah. Okay. What kind of a compensation package you think would be most reasonable for a remote sales manager? I mean, would you offer just a percent from the sales he brought or she? or some fixed remuneration plus percent, or only fixed remuneration, or whatever. Okay, just to... What would be the compensation scheme you would advise? Okay. Thank you. I have a question first. You're going to have to turn that back on and answer. <laughs> um, I just want to clarify sales manager, not salesperson, sales manager, because there's a difference. What's the difference? Sales manager would manager, manage other salespeople. No, no, salesperson. Salesperson, yeah. okay. It depends on the market, but in general, um, straight commission doesn't really work anywhere. It, so there should be some fixed there remuneration? Should be, there should be a fixed base salary. I mean, the person has to eat. Um, and in today's marketplace, I mean, one of the realities today um, is that our industry is growing, despite the price pressures, our industry is growing and there's a lot of demand in the marketplace for salespeople. If you look, if you go on any of the um, industry uh, recruitment sites, so I don't know, uh, Larson Globalization or Adaptive Globalization, you'll see the number of salespeople that, that companies want is, uh, they're just long lists of them. So if you want to attract a good salesperson, you're going to have to pay some sort of a, a base remuneration and then some sort of incentive pay on top of that. Um, because I, I know of some companies out there that want to pay even low base salaries and, and, and a pretty very competitive incentive package and it still isn't competitive enough to attract people. So it's a, it's a tough market right now to hire salespeople. Um, but relying solely on incentive is, it, it's just not really done anymore. I, it's very, very difficult and it's much harder um, for Eastern European co companies and Southern European companies who say want to go to the States or something because the compensation is so, so different. Um, you know, and the cost of living is quite different as well. So that, that makes it even more difficult. Okay, thank you.